Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar with the Spain-US Chamber of Commerce. My name is Juan Carlos Pereira, Executive Director at the Spain-US Chamber of Commerce in Miami. And we are here today to talk about a very interesting topic that affects many businesses around the world, not only in Europe and not only in the US, but specifically in Europe and also uh, to US companies that have some clients in the European Union. And with us today, we are uh, very honored to have one of the leaders in, in these topics and these matters, like Ethica, which is a law firm that I will uh, talk to you about. We have today Ricardo Oliveras and Carlos, and Carlos Perez from Ethica that will guide us and show us a lot about GDPR and how this could affect our businesses. So first of all, welcome Ricardo, welcome Carlos. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Thank you. So before starting everything, um, I will give a brief overview about the company, about Esiha, so that for those of you that don't know the firm, could understand a little bit about uh, their expertise. And also, we will talk a little bit about how it's going to work the presentation. So um, I would just say that uh, we will have a presentation for about uh, 35 to 40 minutes. And at the end of it, we will dedicate some minutes for questions. So any of you that might have any questions that would like to address, please feel free to send those questions through the control panel that you will find on your right side of your screen. Uh, there is a tab that, that says questions. You just need to click there and write your question and send it to us. And we will take care of all of them at the end of the presentation. Um, also, this session is being recorded, and we will also share with you the video so that you could uh, view it again with your colleagues, uh, with your friends, and you could share it with other companies that might be interested in this uh, topic. And also, we will share the presentation. Everything will be shared, uh, will be shared at a follow-up email that we will send after the presentation, later this day, later today. Um, so. As I was saying, just to give you a little bit of uh, context and understanding about what is Ethica. So Ethica, many of you might know the name because it's a city from Spain, but in this case, Ethica is a firm that started in 1997 and it's ranked as a top five independent law firms in Spain with special focus on legal areas such as technology, data protection, entrepreneurship, intellectual property, media and entertainment with offices in spain portugal chile panama costa rica honduras dominican republic guatemala el salvador mexico ecuador brazil and puerto rico as well as representation office in the u.s in the united states specifically in miami as has a multidisciplinary team of over 600 professionals with exceptional experience and expertise in international markets cross-border transactions and legal projects. Um, and about our speakers today, uh, I will start with Carlos. Carlos Perez, attorney and head of information technology and compliance at Ethica office in Barcelona. Carlos has a professional background of more than 25 years advising leading Spanish and international companies on matters related to information technology, communication, intellectual property, privacy law, and compliance regulation. He has developed great part of his career in Landwell, Price Waterhouse, Cooper Tax and Legal Services, where he joined in 1998. Uh, in Price Waterhouse Coopers, he has been partner and head of the information technology department of the firm in Spain. And he has obtained an LLB in law from University of Barcelona, MBA from Esade Business School in Barcelona, an associate professor at the same school in its intellectual property and information society masters. Also, he has an international CISA certification, as qualified information technology system, and is auditor by the ISACA, Information Systems Audit and Control Association. So as you see, Carlos has vast experience in all types of matters related with technology and tele telecommunications law, having advised top level public and private organization. And it's a privilege for us to have uh, to have him with us to explain a little bit more about 
GDPR. So welcome, Carlos. And also Ricardo Oliveras, a partner at Hesija in Miami and Barcelona in Spain. He's an attorney with extensive experience for more than 20 years in business, commercial, and sports law, in particular with an international context. Ricardo began his career at KPMG, a uh, merge and acquisitions department, in 1997. And after seven years at KPMG, Ricardo worked as legal counsel and director for different sport right holders, organizers, uh, and of international sporting events like America's Cup, FIFA, and Super League Formula. Uh, in 2013, he joined Ecija Abogados and was promoted to partner in 2014. He has a Master in Business Law, LLM, from the ISDA, Institute of Law and Economics, PDG, Executive uh, Management Program from ESA Business School, and it's a current lecturer on seminars and conferences, academic co-director of Football Club Barcelona Sports Management and Legal Skill Programs. So as you can see, uh, we have a top of the line speakers today, and, and it's a pleasure and honor have them with us. So without further ado, uh, I will disappear. I will leave the floor for you, Ricardo and Carlos, and, and I'll catch with everyone at the end of the presentation to start with the questions. So thank you so much and welcome for being here with us. Thank you, Juan Carlos. And thank you, the Spain US Chamber for the invitation. We are extremely delighted to have the opportunity to collaborate with you uh, for the first time in a, in a webinar. As a young member of the Chamber, we are here also to, to, to assist and to help all our community in the Spain-US Chamber, as well as all our friends and colleagues in both sides of the Atlantic in any questions that they may need. And and basically, uh, obviously, I will start with a very short introduction of our firm in terms of numbers, okay? And then I will leave the floor to the real start of this presentation, which is uh, my colleague and friend and partner, uh, Carlos. Okay, Ethica, Ethica Law Firm. We are, a, we are a firm, which is a quite young firm. We, we, we just not even 25 years old. And we were established our main headquarters in, in Madrid and then afterwards in, in, in Barcelona. We are, a, we are a full law service firm, which means that we advise on a different areas of law and industry. As such, we are a multi, multidisciplinary team, which means that we can advise, uh, we work on different groups on, depending on the characteristic of each, each client, okay? Uh, we have a really international uh, approach, which means not only that we advise on cross-border transactions, but also we do advise on domestic matters to international foreign clients, either companies, uh, large corporations, or individuals. Okay, in terms of recognitions, Ethica uh, and enlargements, uh, as you said, Juan Carlos, Ethica is very well known within not only the Spanish market, but European market as a top tier law firm in intellectual property, data protection, and te telecommunications. I have to say that uh, this is the reason because, I mean, Ethica core business is this area of expertise, although for the last years, we have become a full law service firm. So here you have some uh, different magazines and legal directories that has recognized our, our firm. I move to the next slide. Well, in, in terms of numbers, uh, these are just for your information, uh, some numbers of Ethica nowadays and, and the different directories that has recognized the law firm and my partners in different areas of, of law. Okay, in terms of practice areas, okay, you can see that we advise in any area with a special focus in, in data protection, intellectual property, and technology. I like to say that data protection, which is the the, the content of today's webinar, it's an area of law which is 
how it should be important for any kind of, of company or whether it's a big company or a small company. I like to say to my clients that data protection is nowadays a tax law. Everybody should be aware of taxes, so everybody should be aware of, of data of data pr protection. So it doesn't matter if it's a large company, a small company, or the industry you are operating. Please bear in mind that there are certain matters of data protection that must be kept in your in your mind always. And following our team, okay, this is just a graphic of what Juan Carlos already anticipated. Our main offices uh, headquarters are in Madrid and Barcelona. Then uh, we open a law firm in, in Portugal. Um, three years ago, we partnered with a legal network in Central America and they became Ethica in Central America. So we have offices in all Central American countries. For the last two years, we have incorporated for law firms in Chile, uh, Brazil, um, and Mexico. Uh, that's very important for us because we're sharing knowledge from Spain to, 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 to Latin America in certain areas of law, such as data protection, will give us the opportunity when we enter in some projects of international dimension, such as working for hotel chains and financial ent entities, such as banks or insurance companies, or even startups. I mean, even startups that are doing their businesses in USA, but they have potential clients or customers in Europe or vice versa. We advise them, regardless of the country they are operating in these areas, because we're sharing our knowledge and we are uh, sending our knowledge to the different offices all around the world. And finally, well, just this is just some of my colleagues in Barcelona office. And here we have, uh, among them, we have Carlos Perez, which is our IT risk and compliance partner and responsible of data protection in, in Spain for, for Ethica. And as you, I'm sure that you will be delighted with his presentation. And he will go through right now and explain you the, the, the agenda for today's webinar. And that's all. Uh, Carlos, the, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Ricardo, and thank you, everybody, for uh, sharing this, this webinar. And uh, well, thank you first to Juan Carlos and to the US and uh, Spain Chamber of Commerce. Well, the pleasure is, is mine and the privilege is ours is to have the chance to, to share all this knowledge and this information with you. So we, what is it that we're going to be talking about on, on data protection? And the, 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 the title of the webinar is What Have We Learned These Two Years? And you will see in the presentation that we have learned some things. In some other things, we have learned nothing. And that is that is the result, that is the outcome of the uh, recent cancellation of the main instrument that was uh, uh, regulating the exchange of personal data between the United States and the European Union, which has been, as you might well know, and if you don't, I will explain it during today, but that, that scenario and that, uh, that instrument has been recently canceled by the European Court of Justice. So we have to restart again what we already restarted some, some years ago. So in some things we have learned nothing. And, uh, but what we will see is, is practical things on what we have seen, what are the main risks and the main issues that we have to deal with, with the GDPR. And we will finish with a brief overview on the California Consumer Protection Act, which is related with data privacy. Uh, let, let me just start by saying that, the, uh, 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 well, just, just uh, as an anecdote, I've been dedicated to these information technologies and data privacy for the last 28 years. And one of the, per the first pieces of legislation that I ever read on information technologies was the first law that was passed in Spain back in 1992 on data protection. And I thought, what a boring piece of legislation. Who would be really wanting to dedicate his life to it? And here we are. Here we are dealing with one of the basic legislations now, which is ruling our activity, at least in Europe. And it's going to be something like a global trend because we know that data and privacy is one of the main issues now. So this is what we will see now. We will see in, 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 in the webinar, what's the threshold from the GDPR point of view? We will see what is protected, practical experiences, what is these transnational implications with this cancellation of the privacy shield instrument that I will explain later on, and a brief explanation on CCPA, and then we will follow with, with some questions. So. Let's go with, with the threshold. So what is it from the point of view on, of the GDPR? What is personal data and what is it that we're dealing with? 
So basically, just to give you a, 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 a clear view on what is personal data, is that different to what we will see with CCPA, with the California legislation, which is the, the scope is much more limited, the GDPR applies to any information that we can link or that we can relate with an individual. So this means that personal data means any information that we can directly allocate and attribute to, to, a, to an individual, but also it is considered personal data, any information that we can link at any moment with the uh, identity of an individual person. So it is not uh, personal data, only this direct uh, personal information, with collection of data or, or pieces of information with, for which we can infer or we can uh, easily uh, arrive to know who is the individual behind that information. So both of them are uh, personal data. Here are some examples that you're watching on the screen. So basically a direct personal data would be the name, telephone, the ID, the signature, the fingerprint, picture, the email address, et cetera, et cetera. Or health information, which is much more sensible. But information that from an identifiable person could also be personal data one clear example is the ip address the internet protocol address i mean the internet protocol address as such is not personal data uh, but if you can combine it with some other information that lead to the identity of the individual who is behind that information then it is to be considered personal data and then it is submitted to some more some of the things that we will see during the presentation today so here are some examples. What's a natural person? What's an individual that, uh, who's, who is to be considered a data subject and who is granted the rights or the, and the, the protections and the safeguards of the GDPR? So it would be a, a, an employee, a client, an individual client of your company, a consumer of your company, a student that you're dealing with, uh, any uh, employee that you are, or any prospect employee that you're dealing with in a, in a recruitment process, any, any individual on, the, on behalf of another company you're signing an agreement with, et cetera, et cetera. So the exception here is that the information that is not under the scope of the GDPR is the information that you can directly attribute or link to a company or to a legal person that is out of the scope of the legislation or out of the scope of the GDPR. So we have to bear in mind just to know what to, on, on which on, or on, on what kind of information all these obligations are going to be applied. That's the first, the first concept from the threshold point of view. The second is, what is it to be considered a data processing? Because all these obligations that we're going to see today apply to the processing of personal data. So just to make it short, processing is anything we do with personal data. Access to it, transfer it to a third party, store it, collect it, obtain it, et cetera, et cetera. So anything we do with personal data falls under the scope of the GDPR. So, and it is submitted to the obligations and to the uh, requirements that we will see during the presentation today. And we will see at the very end that, again, the California legislation is much more limited because it only applies to certain uh, processing of certain things that uh, are to be done with data. But the, we, will, we will save this for the end of the, of, uh, of the presentation. So basically, these are the two concepts. So personal data and information that we can link to an identified or identifiable person and data processing, anything we do with uh, personal data. So based on that, what is it that we have learned during these two years of uh, implementation and enforcement of the GDPR? So what we have learned is that the main areas of risk come from seven potential threats or uh, seven potential risks for companies, which are what you are seeing on the screen, data breaches, cookies, service providers, international data transfer, which we will see, uh, uh, we will dedicate a full chapter of this webinar just to explain it, accountability obligations, the data subject rights and privacy policies. So we will explain it briefly, each one, uh, what does it mean, each one of these areas of risk that are arising from the GDPR. So first one is data breaches. So what is a data breach? The data breaches, any incident that is related with, with the processing of personal data, which might put in danger the privacy rights of an individual. So this means that if any of your organizations is losing organization or is suffering a phishing attack or a malware uh, uh, intrusion in your systems, or anyone in the organization is losing a device, or there's a theft in a device, et cetera, et cetera, or any of these accidents that may have an impact on uh, personal data that the, your organizations are processing, 
if this is likely to generate uh, a, a negative impact on the privacy rights of the individuals to whom the data that have been impacted by the data breach belong, then there are certain obligations that must, must be complied. The main one is that there is a very short deadline of 72 hours to notify this data breach to the Data Protection Authority, to the National Data Protection Authority for whom your, your organization might depend. And that is a quite short um, uh, term just to process all these data breaches. And there's a risk in that. So the main risk is that uh, what we have seen in, the, in a practical experience is that if a company that is suffering a data breach is not doing it within the deadline, uh, there is a risk of penalty. I mean, there is a serious penalty that could be applied here. And we will see how, how important the fines arising from the GDPR uh, uh, can, uh, can result. But the other thing that we're watching is that depending on the way that a data controller, which is the responsible for all this, for handling all this information and complying all these obligations, depending on how this data breach is notified, the Data Protection Authority might, might conclude to understand that not enough security measures were applied to the processing of this, of this personal data, which is an obligation that it is established by the GDPR, that enough uh, security measures must, must be implemented. So what we're seeing is that as a result of, of uh, procedures or the compliance with this data breaches notification, the data protection authorities are concluding that yes, here we see that this data controller did not or was not applying enough security measures. So we will open infringement and penalty proceedings against that, com that company. Despite the fact that that company has complied with the obligation to notify, but the contents of the notification is so clear that there were not enough security measures that this is leading to an infringement and a penalty proceeding. We will see examples of fines. For instance, we are, we are seeing uh, in Spain, we have seen an example of uh, a company which was proposed for a 60,000 euro fine because they lost five unencrypted pen drives containing employee data. <coughs> so we were, we were watching this, this proposal of infringement, but we will see even, even greater fines that have been imposed for these breach on, on, on data security. So what is the recommendation? Well, the GDPR does not establish specifically what are the security measures that must be, must be implemented, but that is clear because there, there are out there uh, international standards on uh, 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 security on information handling and, and, and information systems that can be applied at all times. International, the ISOs and the ENISA standards, which is the European for the GDPR, they can be applied and they, they establish and they, they, they set up a clear definition on the level of security measures that should be implemented, depending on the, the, uh, how critical or how sensitive the processings are. So this is a recommendation to address this risk. I mean, in order to avoid this risk of being fined for not applying enough security measures, just follow the standards because that's what the, the international standards are for, uh, have been established for that purpose and they're good enough just to prove diligence in this uh, specific field. That would be one of the one of the fields. Just for you to give you an idea on how this thread has been growing, these are statistics from the uh, from the, the yearly report that the Spanish Data Protection Authority is publishing. So if you see, if you compare 2008 with 2019, the amount of uh, 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 of reports on data breaches in one year it has grown. 664 percent so this is really a very very serious increase in the risk on on, on from this uh, this specific obligation uh, arising from the gdpr so that would be one <coughs> the second would be the uh, adequacy to the privacy policy so the gdpr is very very detailed and we will see it in in the next slide is very detailed on what kind of information must be provided to a data subject whenever we are processing that data subject's data information. So, and what we're watching is that it is very easy for the data protection authorities just to uh, confirm or just to check that, that any, any given organization is not complying with that obligation because most of them are terms and, terms and conditions on privacy policies or cookie policies that are out there, that are public. They're on the website, but they're in the apps that you can access. So the recommendation is that there is an ongoing review of these privacy policies and these legal texts so that in order to ensure that they comply with all these obligations that are established by these 
uh, three articles that I will detail later on. So basically, uh, Article 13 is saying what information you have to provide when you directly collect the data from the data subject. Article 14, when you get the information from someone else. And Article 49 is uh, information that must be provided when the uh, 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 personal data of that specific data subject is to be transferred internationally to a third country, to a country which does not have uh, a protection similar to the GDPR. So what is it the information that we have to provide? So yeah, as you see, this is quite a lot of work because the what is it that we have to tell to the to the data subject? We have to tell a lot of things, which is we have to inform them about the purposes of the processing. So this means to explain very clearly for what are we, we are going to be processing the data, what are the grounds that uh, enable us and, and are entitling us to really uh, being able to, to process that data. Is it the, uh, the consent? Is it the fulfillment of a contract? Is it because we're forced by law or because there's a legitimate interest, etc.? But we have to explain why. And if it's a legitimate interest, why there must be a clear explanation on what are these legitimate interests. We have to explain what categories of data we're going to be processed, the categories or the types of recipients that we're going, we're going to share the data with, if there are international transfers or, uh, or not, for how long we're going to retain that data, what are the rights that are granted to the individual and even we have to provide them information on how they can lodge a complaint against us or directly on us or before the data protection authority and if we are obtaining the data from a third party we have to inform them about from which source we have obtained that data so as you see there's a lot of information we have to provide and it's easy not to be clear on on that information because the GDPR is very clear in saying that it is not enough with providing that information. It must be provided in a very concise, transparent, intelligible, and very clear way so that anyone can understand. Just allow me the joke, but most of you might remember that movie, that great movie, Philadelphia. Uh, it was long ago, but the, I love there is one I've seen that I, that I love, which is when Denzel Washington is accepting the case uh, from Tom Hanks. And then Sir Washington says to Tom Hanks, no, 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 don't follow that way. Please explain this to me as if I was six years old. So it, this is exactly the example. We have to be very clear in providing this information so that anyone can understand. And when do we have to do it? We have to do it when we get the data from the data subject or if we are getting it from a third party, we have a maximum term of one month just to comply with that information. So. We have to do it this in our websites, in our cookies, when we are processing information on video surveillance, in uh, any forms that the data subject is filling in, etc. We have to do it everywhere. So, what are the best practices in this way? As I said, we have to review on an ongoing basis uh, that we are really complying with these contents. And if we, are, we, if we are planning to use data for different purposes, we have to do an analysis just to see if the the privacy policies that we have been using are useful anymore or not and change it and update it. So, and just do an ongoing audit and uh, every one or two years just to do a really a thorough audit, just to really double check that we are really complying with, with these obligations. That with privacy policies. The third one or the, another, the other risk that we are watching and the lessons that we are getting from the implementation of the GDPR is the enforcement of the rights granted to the data subjects. So, as you, some of you know, but uh, I will explain briefly, any data subject has uh, a number of rights granted. Any data subject might uh, exercise his right of access, so he, any data subject is entitled to know what kind of information any organization is processing. He has the right to ask it to be corrected, to be suppressed, or to oppose to the processing of the data, or even to make it portable or to limit it in certain circumstances. So, the main thing here is that we have a limited deadline to reply if any data subject is exercising any of these rights on uh, our organization. We have one month to reply. And what we, want, what, we, what we are watching is that certain penalty proceedings are coming from uh, rights exercised exercise by these data subjects, which have, have not been properly responded by the organizations that are receiving these claims and these, these exercise of rights. So as you see here in the statistics that have, uh, are published by the Spanish Data Prote uh, Protection Authority, these issues related with the exercise of rights are the third main issue of concern by any, any data subject in Spain, just by the number of uh, 
uh, requests that have been addressed to the Spanish Data Protection Authority. First are claims, obviously, uh, people that directly are finding, lodging a claim before the Data Protection Authority. Second is questions, just to clarify the interpretation of the law. And third is, I want my rights, my rights to be respected. So, uh, as you see, this is a real, real uh, uh, source of, of concern and, and of risk that should, should be properly addressed. What is the, the way of, of addressing it properly? Is to have a real good internal proceeding and internal policies to make sure that whenever an organization is receiving this kind of exercise, that the, it is not just kept in the, in, in the, uh, on, the, on the table. I mean, that it's processed quickly and it's uh, processed properly and it's done uh, under the responsibility of the in-house data protection responsible so that a proper answer is given to the data subject. So as you see, again, this would be the statistics, the statistics on the last uh, yearly report that the Spanish Data Protection Authority has published. So the other um, area of risk and the other lessons that we have learned from the uh, GDPR is a, a principle that was introduced by the GDPR, which is the principle of accountability, which, of course, I mean, in, I, I don't have to, to explain to, to, to uh, uh, in the United States what accountability means. I mean, it is more it is much more difficult to make understand in, in, in countries which are not so related with this concept. When I have to explain this in Spain, basically I use a very bad joke, but it's very clear in the example. Accountability is like dealing with your mother-in-law, with your father-in-law. It is not enough to be good. You have to prove it at any given time. So that is exactly what accountability means. And let me give you an example. We have seen before these privacy policies and how important it is to comply with the contents of these privacy policies. But as important is the content as to have traceability that allow us to prove that any given data subject has accepted a, a specific version of this day, uh, privacy policy at any given time. Because if we are not able to do that, we are not able to, or we are not in a position to prove that we have complied with this uh, information and consent obligation. So we might have the content right, but since we are not able just to, uh, to provide evidence that this specific data subject accepted this in one given time, is it as, if, as if we have done nothing. So it is very important. Traceability is one, of example, is one example of these accountability obligations, but not the only one. Accountability from, uh, from an internal point of view of GDPR compliance in any organization means a lot of things. Uh, some of them, you're watching them on the screen and I will mention them briefly, means that training sessions must be given to the in-house uh, uh, personnel and to the in-house uh, responsible staff for the uh, uh, GDPR compliance so that everyone is sensitized and everyone knows what they have to do in order to comply with the law. But also for a certain, for, for all the data processing that must, that uh, are under the responsibility of an organization, there must be a detailed record of processing, there must be a, a risk analysis done for each one of the processings. For some of the, uh, uh, these processing which they have a certain threshold of sensitivity of data or risk, a specific uh, uh, prior impact analysis report must be done. Uh, there must be, there, there, it is necessary to implement a number of internal policies on data subject rights, on data retention, on uh, 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 processing uh, data breaches, etc. So there's a lot to do from the point of view on accountability. There's a lot of internal uh, policy and and, and, and and procedures implementation that all of them are addressed to really to prove that the organization is is in a in, in a position to prove that is doing all his due diligence in order to comply with uh, with the GDPR, which is the main important thing, and that this is an, an an ongoing process. I mean, it's not only just to have a picture on compliance on a certain on a, on a certain uh, given time. But this compliance has to be an ongoing process for, for all these uh, specific subjects of accountability that you're watching on the screen. Uh, another field of risk is the relationship with the ser service providers and with international data transfers. So basically what you have to know is that the GDPR is establishing an obligation that whenever there is a service providing that is providing a service to an organization, and in order to provide that service that uh, uh, it is necessary for the service provider to have access or to process uh, personal data, which is the responsibility of the main contractor, 
there must be a, a specific contract, a data protection agreement entered between the parties with a, spe a specific wording. So it, one of the things that all organization must ensure is that they have all of them identified all their service providers which are having access to or processing personal data on behalf of the organization and make sure that all of them have entered into an agreement with this specific wording. And as we will see later on, if it mean, if, if the service provider uh, is outside the uh, uh, European economic space and it is located in a country which does not have uh, a, a legislation on data protection which might be similar to the GDPR, there are additional obligations that have to be complied. So the recommendation here is that the organization must really work very hard on really have an updated list of all the service providers and just to make sure that all of them have a proper uh, uh, data protection agreement in place and implemented and duly signed. So this requires a lot of ongoing work and ongoing process. And finally, before we move to uh, uh, international transfer, the last main source of risk that we are, we, are, uh, we are seeing is all the compliance with the cookie policies and similar technologies because the criteria from the European uh, uh, Data Protection Board is going to a more stricter view on an ongoing basis. I mean, very recently, the European uh, Data Protection Board published uh, uh, a report and guidelines on, uh, on consent and cookie policies, and it was very, very strict. I mean, in the sense that all this technique of if you go on navigating, it will be understand that you are providing enough consent, Every, every, every day more, it is, it is watched by the uh, data protection authorities as a suspicious way of providing consent. So they are pushing any organization just to use all these uh, express acceptance by a button or by any similar uh, technique in the cookie banner. So, but again, I mean, the, here the recommendation is that uh, uh, for any organization that is, any organization is using cookies nowadays. So. The, the thing is just to ensure that we are doing an, on, a, on an ongoing basis, we're reviewing that our cookie policy is really complying with all these requirements on consent and that we are really providing all the information that the data protection authorities are requiring on how can we, can any, uh, any uh, visitor of the website can get information, complete information on the cookies, how can the, be, these cookies be deactivated, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, this is forcing organizations just to do an ongoing review and just to make sure that all the cookies that are included in, in the website uh, are really identified in these policies and that uh, a proper consent is being obtained for uh, the installation of these cookies in the, uh, in the system of the, of the user. So these are the main uh, areas of, um, of risk that we have seen uh, after these two years of implementation of the GDPR. And as you see, the fines are really, really substantial. I mean, uh, for serious infringements, which, for example, would be the lack of uh, implementation of a data protection agreement with a service provider, the fines can be up to 2% of the total worldwide turnover of the infringer, which it might be really relevant. But for very serious infringements, which is, for example, processing data without providing this information, this complete information, that I have explained uh, some moments uh, before, the fine here can reach to up to 4% of the global turnover of the infringer. So again, I mean, in addition to the, to the, the damage to the reputation, the amount of the fines can be very serious, as we will see from the examples now. For instance, here are some examples of really, really substantial penalties that we have, we have seen Europe-wide uh, from uh, several sources of risk. For instance, in Germany, a real estate company has been fined on 14.5 million euros for not having an efficient data storage policy implemented, <clears throat> which is quite a substantial uh, fine. In Portugal, we have seen a hospital that has been fined in 400,000 euro, which more or less it might be like $500,000 uh, uh, for not giving access uh, for giving access to patient data to a uh, fake doctor, doctor profile. So this is really a a very uh, serious situation from the point of view of data security. So again, this is a substantial fine. Uh, even bigger, we have seen in the UK, a hotel company that was fined after a breach. So since the company uh, did not, according to the, the uh, UK Data Protection Authority, did not carry an adequate due diligence when acquiring another hotel company, and there was a data breach, 
uh, in the process of the, of the acquisition, they were fined with the fine of 110 million euro, which is very, very substantial fine. But the total record is again in the United Kingdom. Uh, there is a proposal of fine for an airline company for insufficient security measures after a data breach. This is the, the, the main, the, the first risk that I explained to you. So as you see, uh, this airline company notified a data breach and the UK, the UK authorities saw that there were not enough uh, security measures. So the proposal is fine them with 204 million euros in fine. <coughs> so as you will see, the, the, the fines can be very substantial. So the risks are very important to be addressed on an ongoing basis. So now that we have seen what are the main areas of risk, we're gonna be focusing on what's going on with the uh, transnational impl impl uh, implications in the exchange of information between the European Union and the United States. So first is, does the GDPR apply to my company? If, if my company is based in the United States and we don't have a presence in, in, in the European Union, does the GDPR apply to me? So there are three criteria, criteria that we have to bear in mind and are explained in the GDPR, which is uh, if there is an establishment in the European Union or not, if there's, uh, if we as a company, we are targeting or we are controlling uh, data subjects in the European Union, or if there is any uh, 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 international law or international protocol that is forcing the application of the GDPR on my activity. So this will be the analysis. In these three situations, uh, the GDPR could apply to a, an organization in the United States. First is, of course, I mean, uh, we, we always have to be talking about uh, processing of personal data. But this per processing of personal data will apply to a, a US organization if the US organization has an established in the European Union. If not, it will apply if the, uh, the United States organization is offering directly goods or services uh, directly to data subjects in the European Union, or the uh, organization in the United States is, is controlling the behavior of data subjects which are resident, which are uh, uh, living in the, in the European Union. In these two situations, irrespective of the fact that we have an establishment or the US organization has an establishment in the European Union, the GDPR will apply to that organization. And the third one is that, well, if there's a member state law and there is an international a uh, treaty that uh, 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 implies the application of the GDPR to the US organization, then it will apply. But the main, the main ones are the two, uh, the, the, the first two ones. If we have a presence in the European Union, GDPR will apply to us. If we are targeting or we are controlling the behavior of data subjects in the European Union, also the GDPR will apply to us. If not, if we are not in these situations, the GDPR will not directly apply to us, but be careful. Well, First, if the GDPR applies to our company in the United States, there's a number of things that we will have to do. We'll have to analyze if we have to appoint a representative in the European Union or not. We will have to do an analysis to see if we need to appoint a data protection officer for these processing that are subject to the GDPR. We will have to implement policies that are compliant with the GDPR and all the other GDPR obligations that we have been watching and we'll see during the presentation today. But and these obligations are all of this. I mean, just to comply with information obligations, establish record proce uh, pr processing of activities, handle data breaches, uh, implement security measures, etc., etc., etc. All these things that we have been watching uh, uh, during the session today. But be careful. But if if after this analysis, the GDPR is not applying to your company, just be careful because it, it might be that it not directly applied to us, but it will apply to clients or to potential, potential clients that we want to provide services in the, in the European Union. And that will make us just to, um, uh, uh, to make necessary to do uh, uh, the following analysis. So if in the, in the GDPR, there are two concepts that are very important, which is who is the data controller and who is the data processor that we have been watching during the presentation today. So the data controller is the main organization, is the one who takes the main decision, who decides uh, what uh, data are going to be processed, for what purposes, what are the means of processing, etc. The data processor is the service provider, is, is an organization that it is uh, processing information on behalf of the data controller. So here, uh, the data controller has a number of obligations when it, it has to deal with these service providers and with the uh, data processors. So 
in addition of entering into this specific DPA data protection agreement with a specific warning, the data controller is responsible for selecting uh, only data processors that are in a position to comply with the GDPR. And it, also, it is also responsible to verify that these data processors are really complying with all these obligations that are established by the GDPR, in addition to the obligations on international transfer. So this is very important. So when, if we are a US organization providing services to companies in the European Union, we have to bear in mind that in many situations we will be their data processors and that the our clients are forced to comply with all these obligations. And just to enter in these agreements, just to make sure that we are complying with the GDPR, et cetera, et cetera. And when it goes to international data transfers, then the things are, uh, uh, are getting even, even more complicated. So what does it mean, an international transfer? An international transfer means that uh, personal data are moving out from the uh, European economic area. So this means that if uh, a company in the European Union is, is uh, contracting the services of a company in the United States, and these services imply the processing of personal data, this means that we are doing, or the, uh, the European organization is doing an international transfer of data. So what is it that we have to, uh, uh, to bear in mind here? Here are some common examples. So uh, we will have international transfers when we might see data flows within multinational groups. And this applies to clients, to employees, to prospects, to uh, recruiting processes where multinational groups are sharing information worldwide. So this means that there are transfers of data outside the European Union, but also engaging with service providers or when we, uh, a European organization is contracting the services of hosting or any IT services to IT providers in the United States, et cetera, et cetera. So these are very typical examples. So what is it that we have to uh, analyze here? First is, well, if the, if the transfer, I mean, if the, 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 the country of destination has been declared by the data protection authorities as a country which has an equivalent legislation which provides a, a protection similar to the GDPR, then we are safe. I mean, the only thing that we have to do is just to have an agreement with the proper wording and make sure that the uh, service provider is complying with the GDPR and that's it. The main thing here, and we will see it later on, is that until last week, uh, there was a, a, an international treaty and in the start, an, an international agreement between the European Union and the United States governments named Privacy Shield, which was making that uh, companies in the United States that were adhering to or that they wanted to join to these Privacy Shield principles that they were consider as a safe destination of data. So, so organizations in the European Union could freely and could with no further requirements to share information with those organizations. But as we will see later on, this privacy shield protocol has been again canceled by the uh, European Court of Justice. So we will move that later on. So if uh, an organization in the European Union wants to transfer uh, data to outside the, 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 the European economic space and the country of destination has not been declared of uh, an, an, a similar protection, then we have a second choice, which is, and I see it in step three here in red, you will see it, is that the GDPR establishes that in certain circumstances, uh, data can be transferred internationally if they have to comply with specific purposes. For instance, if they come from a public register, or if they are to be done in the context of a transfer of money or banking activities, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, if they, if, if for these specific situations, the, these international transfers can be done. But if not, and if the country of destination is not equivalent as the GDPR, then the only solution is uh, to apply uh, uh, standard contractual clauses. The European uh, authorities approved some years ago models, uh, models of contracts and, and contractual clauses that can be applied between the organization in the European Union and the, import, and the, 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 the importer of data uh, uh, outside the European Union, and in this case, uh, uh, in the United States. The point is that these uh, standard clauses might, might, might be followed by the world. And you will see that many, many uh, service providers in the United States are also are already uh, including these standard clauses in their, in their terms of service. But what has happened with this privacy shield decision that has just invalidated, again, the privacy shield? Uh, as you may know, 
Uh, Schrems is the uh, Austrian individual that started this fight long ago. Uh, some years ago, there was a, a former protocol between the United States and the European Union, which was known as a safe harbor, and also established this, this, this threshold of protection. This was replaced by a new protocol named Privacy Shield because safe harbor was declared invalid some years ago by the European Court of Justice. So the threshold and the, uh, uh, the, 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 the measures of protection that were included in a privacy shield were enhanced just to make happy to the, uh, uh, the, the, pri the prior decision of the European Court of Justice. But again, the European Court of Justice has declared this new protocol as invalid because it does not provide enough protection as demanded by the GDPR. So what the court has analyzed is these two things, privacy shield and if these standard clauses are enough to share data with organizations of the, of the European Union. So what has happened with the privacy shield? It has been declared invalid very briefly for two reasons and for two main reasons. One is that according to the United States legislation and according to the surveillance legislation that is enforced in the United States, any organization at any given time will be forced to provide information to the US government. So this means that it will be forced to provide any information, including data protection, or personal data of clients of, uh, of these uh, organizations in the United States. So this means that any company or any organization that is contracting the services of a U.S. organization in the United States, it is sure that in a certain moment in time, personal data that are under the responsibility and that are being processed by these companies in the United States, they might be able to finish in the hands of the U.S. government. So the European Court of Justice has said no, this does not respect the level of protection that is provided by the GDPR. So privacy shield is not avoiding this risk. Therefore, it is not a proper way of protecting uh, 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 privacy rights for individuals in the United States. The second reason is that the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the protection and the threshold for uh, claims and, uh, and to lodge complaints in the United States according to privacy shield again was not enough because there was an ombudsman whose role was uh, established by the privacy shield but again the european court of justice says no this is not enough data subjects in the european union and the data controllers in the european union they must have real effective ways of protecting their rights which go beyond to this so for these two reasons this uh, protocol privacy shield this was which was covering the exchange of data between the united states and the, and the european union has been cancelled so again, all these companies that were publicly listed and that, have, that they had joined Privacy Shield, now they have to revisit their situation with the relationship with, the, with their customers. Because the other option, in order just to make valid, and according to the GDPR, this transfer of data, is to apply these models of clauses that have been approved by the uh, uh, authorities of the European Union. But again, the decision of the European Court of Justice on these standard clauses says, okay, they are still valid, but what the European Court of Justice is saying, well, in addition to applying these clauses, the organization in the European Union must proceed with a risk analysis and with an assessment if the legislation of the country of destination is really protecting privacy or not, based on these two rates that I have mentioned before. So, and it is unclear because the European Board on Data Protection has not come up yet with uh, specific recommendations on how to establish additional safeguards to these clauses in order to protect, protect these risks. But one of the things that now organizations in the European Union contracting services to providers in the United States will have to enter into this, into this uh, risk analysis and decide, well, is it enough with the standard clauses? Should, should I add uh, additional safeguards and commitments by saying, look, I I have a commitment of not to deliver this data to the U.S. government, which can be illegal in the United States, or should the U.S. Uh, organization take the decision of just placing all the processing in the European Union and not doing any processing in the United States, that it is really something that is now open to any discussion and that we will see how it evolves in time, because now this is so recent that, recent that we will be waiting for new outcomes and new recommendations from the European Board uh, on Data Protection. So, and just to finish, and just to give some time for questions, a brief reference to the uh, California Consumers Protection uh, Act, and a brief comparison with, uh, 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 with the, uh, uh, the GDPR. 
just for your information, these, of course, this, this, this legislation applies only to in, in California, and uh, it only applies to for the protection of the privacy rights of consumers which are resident in California. So this does not apply in general to any data subject, as it happened with the with the GDPR, but only to consumers and in 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 terms of employees. Normally, an employee notice to the employees on the information that we will see later on would suffice to comply with uh, with the CCPA. Uh, it has a limited scope, so uh, as I said, it only uh, uh, applies to consumers' data. Uh, yeah, it only applies to the control of the means and the decisions of the processing. Uh, it, this means that it applies to the organizations that really have these controls of these means and that they do business in California and that they meet with these one of these minimum thresholds. So that they have a minimum $25 million uh, of yearly turnover or that they process at least uh, 5,000 registers of consumers' data, or that more than half of their benefits are the result of selling the data of their of their customers. So these organizations that are meeting with the thresholds, the CCPA will apply to them. And the CCPA applies not to all any uh, kind of data processing. It only applies to protect the collection of uh, these data uh, and the, the transfer of these data to third parties. This is the only thing that it is protecting. So it is. it does not apply to any kind of processing that these organizations will be doing with this data of uh, Californian consumers. So, and what are the rights granted? The rights granted are basically is the right to know what information is being collected, with whom the information of the categories of recipients with whom the data will be shared, the right to object to the sale of the personal information that belongs to the, to, to the consumer, and the right to have an equal service and price despite or irrespective of the fact that this person has exercised his privacy rights or not, and the right to delete personal information if so requested. And if this is not, if there's any breach in this legislation, here are the penalties that are foreseen by the CCPA, so basically are two. There's a private right of action that it is allocated to any consumer, so any consumer can start this action, and it, is, it, it might request an injunctive or any declaratory relief, to protect his rights or any other relief that the court may deem appropriate and the penalties or the damages that might be imposed might go from one hundred dollars to seventy seventy seven hundred fifty thousand dollars per consumer and per incident or the actual damages whichever is greater in the amount but in addition to this or in, on top of this uh, private right of action granted to the consumers also the attorney general in in california has the right to pursue and, uh, and to, uh, to impose civil penalties so if the attorney general has detected any infringement, may issue a 30 days consumer no compliance notice to the organization. And if this organization is, it does not provide a remedy within that deadline, there's a penalty that, that, that might be imposed, which is $2,500 by violation, but that this penalty might, might go up to $7,500 for each intentional violation if there's really an intentional breach of the protection granted by the CCPA. So this is briefly what I wanted to explain on what we have learned uh, in the implementation of uh, the GDPR and the, this new scenario on international transfers and the CCPA. So if there are any questions, uh, I would be more than happy just to provide an answer for them. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you so much for, for this great presentation. And I think there is a lot of things there to to assimilate. So um, uh, yes, we already have uh, some questions, and any of uh, the other attendees that would like to send the questions, remember to send them through the control panel that you have on the right side of your screen. Um, so diving in directly to some of the questions that that we got today. Um, the first one. Um, so it's the corporate email of a person subject to data protection or that comes above the company as a legal company well that, that's that's a very good question because uh, let me give you an example in in spain the, the legislation that was in, in force in spain before the gdpr was excluding these specific specific piece of information from the scope of the data protection legislation but with the GDPR, it ha it, this has come back again under the scope of the law. So this means that uh, what the GDPR is defining as personal data is any information that you can link to an individual. And the name of the person or even a specific email 
be linked to a specific person, it can be personal data. So for instance, my email address, since it has part of my family name and, and the firm name, I mean, it, it, it really can be understood as, a, as personal data. If we have the general one, the typical info at, I don't know, etihad.com, uh, that will not be personal data because it's direct, directly linked to the company. But if I can reach to an individual after it's behind that first, uh, uh, email address, then this is to be considered as um, personal data. However, uh, the legislation, at least the one in Spain, makes it easier because there's a direct, there's a direct recognition in the law that if we want to use this information or this email address, not to have a personal relationship with me, but have a relationship with the organization that has provided me this, this email address, then there is legitimate interest just to use this information. So there is no need for consent. The only thing that we need to do is to inform that person. So it is easier to comply with that, provided that we really want to use the email address to have a relationship with the company to whom this email address belongs. I don't know if this is, this is clearly explained. Sure, it, it definitely explains. Uh, just a question here then. So if, a, if someone gives you their business card uh, at a conference uh, and you end your trip and you return to your office and you have 500 business cards with corporate email of many different people, um, are you, those email addresses that are definitely linked to, to specific people that works for organizations, those will be subject to, to data protection or it will be a legal company? No, 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 they, they will be subject to legal protection. So the, the, what, what would you need to do here is always, at all times, if you, if you can, keep the cards. If you, mm -hmm. if you may scan it and you just link it with your CRM, that's okay. Because again, remember that there is this, this accountability principle obligation that you have to be in a position to prove that you comply with the law. So if you are in a position to prove that this person provided you with the business card, that's okay, because this means that the person voluntarily gave you that information. The second, and this is something that we are recommending to any client of ours, and we are doing it in our firm, is that any time that whenever there is in, an information from a business card which is introduced in our CRM, automatically the CRM is sending a message to that person saying, look, you have been added to our CRM, this is the information according to the GDPR, you can object to, your, to the processing at any time. And with that, you're safe home. Wonderful. Thank you. That's yes, very... and if, if you allow, allow me, in, in terms of the business card, just remind me that something that we have learned in terms of corporate transactions for the last two years, in particular cross-border transactions, is how, is it, how, how important is data protection for organizations? Obviously, not only from a legal perspective, as Carlos said, or image in terms of damage to reputation, but also in terms of business. I mean, a proper data protection policy, it's a goodwill for a company. It's an important asset. Indeed, it is very, uh, it, it's very uh, ongoing that when we are now discussing and drafting uh, SPAs in terms of purchase of companies, 10 years ago or five years ago, there was only one paragraph on data protection. Now it's, it's, a, it's a long, like two pages on, of warrants and guarantees on, on this point. And just to explain you that uh, how important it is for companies of any industry, data protection, it is also a good tool to monitorize and to generate revenues. That came to my mind uh, recently in a, in a conference of, of a CEO of of Manchester City. Manchester City is one of the largest clubs in, in the world. And he was asked which were the three key factors that have led uh, Manchester City to generate more revenues because he lives in a neighborhood with Manchester United, which is one of the largest football clubs in the world. And he said data protection to have a proper uh, data protection policy because that allows us to access to more and more funds all around the world. And we have more than 20 million funds. And if we can just only monitorize this personal data with one euro, two euros per fund, it would generate us more than 20 or 30 millions per year. So uh, that gave me and bring us to all the attendance that also that's a protection, it's a goodwill for a company of if any kind of companies. Great point, great point, and thank you, thank you, Ricardo, for that. Uh, another question that we got here is: um, Is there a citation to the SCC? 
Sorry, can you, can, you, can you say that? Can you make the question again? Yes, it's it's quite brief, but it's just, just asking, is there a citation to the SCC? Me, meaning that if there's an if there's an access or there's a, there's the possibility of, of providing what is the wording to be applied? Uh, not really sure, but um, if, if if that if that is the question, yes. I mean, I think that in the presentation there is a link. If not, I I'm, I will be very happy just to provide the link to the most recent uh, uh, approved uh, uh, standard clauses approved. Because yeah, I mean it's accessible. I mean if you go to the to the Euro, to the website of the European uh, uh, Data Protection Board, uh, there you can have access to the to these models of clauses, and you know what is the wording that has to be applied. Okay, perfect. Um, another question that we got here is someone is asking, so every time a cookie banner appears when I am browsing a website and I click no, uh, is that the case that then the company cannot obtain and use my information? Well, I mean, it, it depends on how the, the, the organization wants to implement that cookie policy, but if as a, as a user and as a visitor of the website, you, you say no. This means that you are rejecting that uh, all the cookies or the cookies that you have chosen will be installed on your device and will start tracking information. So that is exactly what these uh, uh, the, the European authorities are looking for, is that it is very clear at any moment to any visitor of any website that before a cookie is installed in, in his or her device, that the user has a very clear knowledge of what cookies are going to be installed, what are the purposes of the cookies, what kind of information are going to be processed, and how the, the user can choose which ones uh, the user wants to be uh, uh, installed and which ones don't. So that is basically what the, it has to be complied. The way that each organization wants to do it, I mean, there are several options, but remember, the clearer you are, the far away you are from being fine, and fines are very relevant. So if you are providing in a cookie banner, let's say, look, you can accept them all. I mean, you can, if, if you are providing this, um, this mechanism of a button saying, I accept them all, you have to bear in mind that in the second layer of information, you have to find uh, 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 another uh, button to disconnect them all, because you have to be able to just to withdraw your consent as easy as you gave it. But also, I mean, there, there are other options. I mean, we are watching organizations that are providing the, uh, the direct access on how you can you can choose your uh, uh, configuration of, of the of the cookies directly in the cookie banner. So there are many many choices here. What it must be clear is that any any user or any visitor of a website must clearly have this information and must provide clear consent on cookies that are really tracing that information. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carlos. Another question that we have is how does uh, the GDPR govern the personal and other data of the deceased? Oh, it's out of the scope of the law. I mean, the, the information of the deceased people is, is out of the scope of the law. So uh, basically, it does not apply to that people, <laughs> fortunately. Okay. okay. Good. Um, another question that we have is is it possible to send emails uh, with information of our company to an email address um, that we obtained through the purchase of a database? Well, that's, that, that, that would, that, in order to answer to that question, we might need another webinar. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, but, but the, and this is, no, this is very interesting because all these, the anti-spam regulation in Europe, all these regulation on what kind of uh, uh, promotional activities can be done using electronic means, they are governed by a different piece of legislation. There is a European directive on uh, confidentiality on electronic communications, which is now uh, about to be replaced by another, uh, by another uh, regulation, which is known the e-privacy regulation. Uh, just to, to provide you some, some legal background. Uh, the difference between a regulation and a directive is that a regulation is the same law for all around Europe. A directive means that there is a minimum legislation and then each country might implement it locally, uh, whichever they want to, which is, leads to really lack of harmonization. So a regulation is a higher threshold. So in, let's say in one year time, we'll have this new regulation, but just to make it sure, basically the point is that 
it doesn't matter if you if it's personal data or not. If you want to send uh, commercial information to an email address, the main principle is that you had you you need prior consent from the recipient. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. if the recipient is a company or an individual. The only exception is that you can send promotional mm -hmm. uh, publicity or promotional uh, messages without that need of consent if one the recipient is, is a prior client of your company or has a prior a, a prior relationship with your company is a prospect to be said and you are sending promotional information about goods or services which are similar to the prior relationship in, in that situation you can really i mean basically to your clients and your prospects provided that you are uh, promoting things which are similar to what they bought or what they showed interest you can really send publicity without the need of consent of course they can oppose at any time so they can ask i don't want to receive any more publicity that that has that has to be granted but in other situations you always need to uh, to prove that you have the prior consent of the recipient uh, if not well now the fines are not are not really heavy they're substantial but when the e privacy regulation comes the the the, the, the level of fines will be as high as the gdpr it will be 2% 4% of the global turnover well, great. Thank you so much. A very interesting. I mean, it's a question that uh, we um, we hear a lot here. Um, another question, it's, it says, how can we cope with the need that a consultancy company, a third party, uh, needs to implement a, a CRM or an ERP in our company? Because in mm -hmm. order to do that, they need full access to our database and, and yeah. sometimes passwords. So, is it legal to give them access to that database for the purpose of implementation and how can we protect ourselves absolutely absolutely i mean the only thing it, it, this is one of maybe one of the less complicated situations in the gdpr if you remember from the presentation the any an organization that is helping in the implementation of an of an erp of a, or, or a crm is a service provider so basically the company will be having access to our databases because they needed to implement this they, need, they needed to implement the, the ERP or the CRM or whatever. I mean, whatever software that they, they are implementing. So what we will need to do is just to make sure that the service agreement with that company includes the uh, compulsory wording that the GDPR is asking for that situation. So if we do that, I mean, if we introduce that wording and we make sure that the service provider, if the service provider is really in a position to comply with the GDPR that has internal policies on GDPR, that has its own records of processing that is providing its employees with training on GDPR, et cetera, et cetera, then we are fine with that. I mean, it's fully legal, we can do it. I mean, it can be properly handled in this way. Perfect. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, another question that we have is, um, what kind of internal procedures and policies should be advisable to implement to ensure GDPR compliance? Oof. A number of them. There's a number of them, but the minimum, the minimum that I would recommend would be the following. One is the uh, an internal policy or an internal definition of what is the uh, the the GDPR governance that we want to apply in our organization. Do we need a data protection a data protection officer or not? Because not all organizations we need are forced to appoint a data protection officer. But if not, if we are not forced to appoint a DPO, who is the one in charge in the organization? Because at the very end, as Ricardo was explaining, I mean, this is applying to any kind of organization. So as at the very end, uh, somebody in the organization will have to be responsible. I mean, it, it, it will have to be a DPO or not. So we will have to develop a, a, an internal procedure to say, well, who is the responsible to make decisions or to ensure compliance with the GDPR? <clears throat> and how do we relate this with any department or with any area in the organization because it is the areas that really know what is going on what are the business processes in, or the ongoing business processes if they imply the, the processing of personal data or not so there must be a real communication between the responsible and the areas just to make sure that we are constantly and update, updated and compliant that would be one proceeding the gdpr governance the second one would be a procedure on how to handle data breaches you see how important it is to handle it quickly and to make sure that we notify to the data protection authority in a way that we are not putting ourselves in risk 
by saying, yeah, I mean, I was, I, I was not implementing proper security measures. So yeah, please find me, please regulate us. So we, we want to avoid that. So we need an internal policy for that. Another one would be just to properly handle, handle the exercise of rights uh, that the data subjects might address to our organization. So if any, any, any given data subject is addressing a request to our company saying, look, I want you to erase my data, or I want to know which data you have, we need to have an internal procedure just to move quickly and to make sure that we prop that we respond to this uh, in, 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 in timely fashion and that we do it properly and with proper information as established by the GDPR. The other one would be data retention policies. You've seen the, the, the penalty that the German authority has imposed to uh, an organization in Europe. So we have to define for how long we're gonna keep that, the, the data in our systems and in our, in, in our stores and, and in, in, in mainly in our, in our systems and how we're going to do it when the uh, when the deadline is finished. So we need to implement these data retention policies. And uh, finally, which is uh, maybe the other the other um, important uh, uh, internal procedure that I will be implementing, those ones that are, uh, that are addressed to ensure that we comply with all these accountability obligations that I have been mentioning. So that if we need to do this risk analysis, how do we do it? That if we have to issue a specific report, et cetera, et cetera. This would be the main ones. Depending on the organization, we might need specific ones because every every organization has its own its own story, but this would be the main ones. Yes, and I would like to say that depending on the organization and sometimes uh, depending on, on, on the business of, of the client. Just to give you another example, it's recently we have a client, new client, it's a startup that moved from from Guatemala and California to, to Spain. They just set up their own uh, subsidiary. And after that, they came to us for an implementation of, of, of data protection policy. And there were some, obviously, they need to, to monitor the expenses, their costs, because they are here to in, in Spain to get a new market. And, and we tell them the, the minimums, minimums, as Carlos said. But suddenly, we tell them, what, but who are your clients? Who are your prospects? And they tell us, the insurance market. Well, then that's different because if your clients, your potential clients are the insurance companies, be sure that they will ask you a certain level of degree of data protection. So sometimes it's organizations and sometimes you have to add in particular the, 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 the industry that you, 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 your the client will be operating. Okay, perfect, wonderful. Um, so we are exceeding 18 minutes from, from 12, that it's um, the, the one hour time. So we're going to go for the last question. There are several others, but as I mentioned before, the, the video is going to be shared uh, with all the attendees as well as the presentation. And for the remaining questions, we will send the answers to all the attendees so that you can take a look to them. Um, and the latest, the latest question that we got, it's... Um, uh, we are a small company, uh, not a lot of resources, and we have some clients from the European Union. Um, comply with all these regulations would be a, a heavy burden for our small organization at this time. And being a US company, my question is how Europe is going to enforce if we don't comply 100% with all the regulations that GDPR applies, that I think that we should apply to some of our clients that comes from Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that, is, that is a very interesting question. And first, what I would say is that, well, don't get mad. In the first thing that we have to analyze is, do, does really the GDPR applies on us? Because if it doesn't, or if it, there's a limited application, maybe we have, we have to have a limited concern. Remember, when there is a direct application of the GDPR, when we are tar when the, the organization is targeting or controlling the behavior of uh, residents in, in the European Union. So I'm quite sure that a small organization won't be doing that. So what if the if this this organization what it's doing is providing services to organizations in the in in the in the European Union, then basically what the the, the really should be focusing is that the uh, the, the 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 terms and conditions and the the, the contractual conditions are really complying with what the GDPR is, is demanding. And, but there is, but there is here is, there is an interesting situation, as I said, with the international transfer of data is that since its privacy shield has been invalidated again, and we know the reasons why, there is a, I mean, there might be an option or there might be 
a decision making process that the organization in the US will have to take, which is, I mean, what is it that, that what is it that I have to choose? I mean, uh, do we do I have to uh, uh, locate my services in the European Union, or should I accept some uh, additional safeguards just to comply with with the GDPR? Uh, just trying to answer the question is, if uh, a, a, a small organization in the United States is not complying with the GDPR, of course, it is very difficult that the data protection authorities in the European Union will get a hold of them. Maybe the remedy will come that if there's any breach or any fund that can be imposed, there can be there, there can be any compensation on the you know on the withdrawal of benefits from the European Union. But that is an, that is something that we will have to wait and see. And this is something that it is not clear. The the thing is that the reason why this uh, privacy shield protocol has been invalidated, one of the reasons is precisely that because there is no reach on the on the US organizations. I mean, basically what the European Court of Justice is saying, okay, US organizations might choose not to respect these, these privacy principles and barely nothing will happen to them. So again, I mean, it is very difficult to provide an answer at that because again, this will boost, this will boost again, conversations and negotiations between the United States government and the European Union government. Because again, this is posing, you know, a situation for all the exchange of information between the two territories. So the solution is going to be to come immediate. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much, Carlos. Um, well, we will uh, leave it uh, there uh, for today. But um, Carlos and Ricardo, it's been a pleasure having you with us. Uh, thank you for all the information and the knowledge that you share. And thank you to Ethiha for having allowed us to understand a little bit better how GDPR is uh, affecting the companies in Europe and also here in the United States. So thanks very much for being with us today. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Juan Carlos and all your team. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And for the rest of you, thank you for attending this webinar with the Spain US Chamber of Commerce. I hope we'll see you again in the next uh, activity that we host. And remember to check our website, uh, spainuschamber.com, where you will be able to check all our activities and also our services. Thank you, everyone, and take care. Have a good day.